Welcome to the Bible Broadcast with preacher, teacher, and missionary Perry Demopoulos. The Bible Broadcast is a ministry for the purpose that the lost might be saved, that the saved may be edified, and that the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, would be glorified. We hope that the Lord will bless you with today's message. Join in with us now and let's hear today's broadcast. Now, the subject we're going to take up today has to do with comfort for the born-again believer in Christ. And more distinctly, we're going to deal with the rapture of the body of Christ and how that is in contrast to the literal, visible, glorious second advent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that contrast is expressed in 2 Timothy 2.15 where the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18, our text is found dealing with the rapture of the body of Christ. In verse 13 we start, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him, that is, their bodies. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now watch this in verse 18. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It is one of the greatest comforts that anybody could ever have if you're a saved, born-again believer. That verse or that section, that passage here in the Bible ought to be a great comfort to you. Now, this doctrine of the catching up is called the rapture. It comes from the Latin word raptera, is vital for the Christian to understand because there is a lot of deception and misunderstanding as to what is going to happen at the end of the church age. Does the body of Christ go through the tribulation, or part of it at least? The problem begins where believers in Christ are not capable of rightly dividing the word of truth, according to 2 Timothy 2.15, which is not in any other version in English of the Bible. Can you imagine that? That is Satan at his best deceiving preachers and teachers and so-called scholars of Greek and Hebrew who would not agree with the King James Bible even if the Greek, the Greek, they call it the Greek, agrees with the King James Bible. The majority of your so-called believers are Bible illiterates. And making proper divisions and contrast is so vital. And the command to make those contrasts is right here in 2 Timothy 2.15. Not only that, when the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, the heresies are going to pop up, so that they which are approved of God may be made manifest. Now, go to 1 Corinthians 11.19, and the Apostle Paul mentions this. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are, watch it, approved, may be made manifest among you. So to be approved, and more so approved unto God, not only just be made manifest among you, that is among people, you have to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now anybody knows that a square peg could not fit into a round hole if the diameter of that circle was the same distance from side to side in a square peg, that peg could not get into that hole simply because the corners of that peg don't allow it to get in there. Now, any baby could figure that out. 
you have men that and women that are saved 10, 15 years, and they cannot figure the Bible out because they've never learned how to rightly divide the word of truth, and they make a complete mess, or should we say a bowl of spaghetti, of the Bible because they've never learned how to divide it properly. Now maybe you say, before we get into the contrasts here, that the greatest comfort offered to the believer in Christ is the rapture. That ends all his problems on this earth. There's not one problem that couldn't be cured instantaneously at the rapture, whether it's illness, mental illness, sorrow, loss of job, loss of loved ones, deformity, poverty, a bad habit, maybe you're in jail, or you're laying in the hospital, you're full of pain, you've made some very bad decisions in your life, and you're reaping that now, even the false belief that you are going to lose your salvation, and that you are going to go through the tribulation. If you are saved, that is, born again, and I don't mean baptized, or you've taken a wafer, or you've done the sign of the cross, I mean you've accepted the person, the living, resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your personal Savior, there is not one problem, not one, that won't be fixed at the rapture. Hallelujah. Now that is a great comfort to any believer. Now if you were to die before the rapture, that is gain. For the Apostle Paul said, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21 Nobody and no religion can offer you that kind of comfort. But what about us who are alive right now? So let's say that the rapture takes place. What's the difference between what will happen with you at the rapture and what will happen at the end of the Great Tribulation when the Lord Jesus Christ literally shows up and comes down to this earth? Now, we offer to you this chart of contrast in our sermon outline. And you can go ahead and download that and print it out and use it for teaching or preaching or whatever you want when you've got to deal with people that think that the believer in Christ is going to go through the Great Tribulation. And there's no way he's going to be comforted thinking he's going through the Great Tribulation. And we're going to deal with that as we go down this list of contrasts. So let's begin. Number one, the rapture, that is, of the church, is a mystery. In 1 Corinthians 15:51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed. Now, the contrast to that concerning those in the Great Tribulation, there is a resurrection of saints in that time period that is not a mystery. The resurrection of the dead nor the literal second coming are not mysteries in the Bible. Both were clearly mentioned centuries before Christ's appearance. Now, you can write down Job 19, 25 through 27, Isaiah 26, 19 to 21. Ezekiel 37 talks about those dry bones in the valley that they are breathed on and they come up. That's a resurrection that was read in the Old Testament. The whole chapter is dealing with those dead folk that are risen in the Great Tribulation. Acts 23, where the Apostle Paul deals with that before the religious council. And I mean council, because if you say the word Sanhedrin, you're going back to the, quote, originals, end of quote, which you don't have and you haven't seen, despite the fact that you may have studied Greek and Hebrew for years. The King James text will shed ten times more light on any given biblical subject than any Greek or Hebrew text, hands down, all the way. So your Greek, whether it's Antiochian or Alexandrian, is out of date putting things only in an historical account, therefore covering up what the modern-day councils are doing, and you have much more advanced revelation when you come to the international language, English, of the Reformation text of the King James Bible of the Philadelphian period of the church age. So then you can be more practical because what Bible-believing preachers have to deal with today are councils, religious councils. That's the correct word rather than the outdated Greek Sanhedrin. And in Acts 24.21, we read this. Acts 24.21, Except it be for this one voice that I cried standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. Do you see that? Paul knew about that resurrection that was mentioned so many times in the Old Testament. So, you have the rapture of the body of Christ on one side, It was revealed only to the body of Christ after Paul got that revelation. 
Now to us it's no longer a mystery. But the promise of the post-tribulation resurrection was clearly promised to the nation Israel. You can read also Psalm 50 verses 4 and 5. Contrast number 2. For the rapture of the body of Christ, the verbiage is very clear. It says this in 1 Corinthians 15.52, trump. And in 1 Thessalonians 4.16 it says a trump and the trump of God. You find the word trump mentioned only two times in the entire Bible, and they're mentioned only in the Pauline epistles. A trump is the sound of a trumpet, and that is very important for you to understand. Now, the phrase, in contrast to trump, is seven trumpets, is nowhere mentioned in the Pauline epistles to the church of God. But they are mentioned in Joshua four times. Very interesting because Joshua is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Joshua and the nation Israel went into the promised land and fought against the Hamites, the Canaanites. And seven trumpets is mentioned twice, only two times more, in the book of Revelation, chapter 8, verses 2 and 6. And not only that, the word seven is never mentioned to the church age except in Romans 11.4 about Israel, and there were 7,000 that didn't bow the knee to Baal. Now, you've got to get these contrasts where the Apostle Paul is quiet about something, but it's mentioned somewhere else in the Bible, and vice versa. Something that is not mentioned in the other epistles, but it's mentioned to the Apostle Paul to the church. You've got to get that difference. What what are we doing? We are rightly dividing the word of truth according to a King James Bible and not a new King James Bible. Contrast number three concerning the rapture of the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, we read, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You see, at the last trump, we all are changed at a twinkling of an eye. And that means that that one sound of that trumpet, there's only one event that will take place. But when those hear the trumpet sound in the Great Tribulation, there are many events which will take place, and not only that, days in duration to fulfill. And in contrast to the rapture of the body of Christ, you have in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, we read, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So you have earthquakes going on here. And the tenth part of the city fell. Well, which city? Well, Jerusalem. The body of Christ is not directly connected with Jerusalem. What do believers in various parts of the earth have to do with Jerusalem? We're talking about the Jewish nation and their city, which is Jerusalem, in their land, that land, and the Jewish nation, Israel. And the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted, and gave glory to the God of heaven. Very interesting, we see here seven thousand. Just like you find in 1 Kings 19.18, where 7,000 didn't bow down to Baal. We're dealing with the nation Israel here. Now, contrast number four, where we make a division between the rapture of the church and resurrected and raptured in the Great Tribulation. Number four, the rapture of the body of Christ will happen before the opening of the seven vials of the Great Tribulation. The rapture at the end of the church age saves us from the wrath to come. Now, if you read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says this. 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. If that weren't enough, the Apostle Paul wrote in the fifth chapter, in verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. But to obtain salvation, that's the rapture, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in contrast to that, what do we read in Revelation verse 7, 14, 13 and 14? And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, 
What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. In that very same chapter, in the context, he's dealing with 144,000 Jews that are eunuchs, not females, eunuchs, men, that were sealed, and so many of the 12 different tribes of the nation Israel during the Great Tribulation. Further dealing with this wrath to come, they were taken out in and during that wrath, but we have been delivered from that wrath. In Revelation 6, 16 and 17, we read, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Do you see that? For further study, you can read Revelation 15, verse 7, and 16, verse 1. And in those contexts, a rapture takes place to save tribulation saints during the fury of the great tribulation. They're in it, but we have been delivered from it and from the wrath of God. Contrast number five. You will notice that in the Pauline epistles, you have not written one time the phrase great tribulation. In contrast to that, you have in Matthew twenty four twenty one. We went through that last recording when we dealt with those that are taken. In Matthew twenty four twenty one, and in Revelation two twenty two and seven fourteen, all three contexts are dealing with the great tribulation. Whereas the Apostle Paul does not use those two words, great tribulation, concerning that particular event in his epistles to the body of Christ. Contrast number six. In the church age dispensation, a man is saved by grace through faith without works, with the exception of that little transition period there, right after the cross, until the Jews rejected their Messiah in Jerusalem. And you have in chapter eight of the book of Acts, the first time where a man, once he believes, he is saved without water baptism, Acts two. He is saved without laying on of hands, Acts eight. He is saved by grace through faith without any works in Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. And then all of Paul's epistles dealing, uh, writing to the church, the body of Christ you have in Romans 4 verse 4, not of works. You have in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, not of works lest any man should boast. You have in Titus 3, 5, not of works, but by grace, so on and so forth. But in contrast to that, In the tribulation, they operate under a faith and works system for personal salvation. That's why you read in Matthew chapter 24, 13, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. You have in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, that a man can lose his salvation, and it's impossible for him to be renewed again. You have that context there. You have in in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 38 and 39, But now the just shall live by faith, but if, condition, any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. And right in the context in verse 37, for yet a little while, tribulation context, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. So a person can draw back and lose a salvation in the tribulation. They have to reject from receiving the mark of the beast, 666. They have to keep the law. Look what it says in Revelation 12, 17. Listen carefully. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which, look at this, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Look at that combination. If that weren't enough, look at Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that Number one, keep the commandments of God. And two, and the faith of Jesus. Do you see that? You don't have that commanded to the born-again believer today. The Apostle Paul said, not of works, lest any man should boast. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Now that's why it's very crucial for you to learn how to rightly divide the rapture of the body of Christ from the second coming of Jesus Christ according to 2 Timothy 2.15. 
And we also made the contrast last time when we dealt with the Jew and the Gentile and the Church of God in 1 Corinthians 10.32. Contrast number 7. Now there's a difference between the Lord Jesus Christ coming for His saints at the rapture of the body of Christ and Him coming with His saints when He comes at His second advent. Christ comes back with the bride, the church, and at the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come back with Him. You've got to get that contrast. Contrast number eight. The rapture of the body of Christ is not visible to the world. It's private. It is a secret to the world, and there is not one scripture that all will see Him. You see, we meet Him in the air, and He takes us home to our home in heaven. At the second advent, it is a visible return. For in Revelation 1-7, we read this, Behold, He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see Him. That's Revelation 1-7. Also in the tribulation context, Matthew 24-29 deals with the tribulation in those days. The sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and so on and so forth. And in verse 30, we read this, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look at the contrast. Contrast number nine. During the rapture of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ comes and the church meets him in the air. He does not touch the earth. He doesn't come down to the ground. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now in contrast to that, if you were to read just Ezekiel 43 verse 7, the Bible says, And he said unto me, Son of man, the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of the children of Israel forever. And my holy name shall the house of Israel no more defile, neither they nor the kings by their whoredom, nor by the carcasses of their kings in their high places. Now you can also read Zechariah 14.4. That's a good place. Matthew 25, verses 31 to 34. And Luke chapter 1, verse 32. And many other places to prove This contrast between the rapture of the body of Christ and the literal second advent of Jesus Christ when he comes down to this earth. Contrast number 10. During the rapture of the body of Christ, there is no change in nature. But in contrast to that, at the time of the second advent, approximately two-thirds of the world is destroyed, both on land and at sea. You can read about that in Revelation 8. Verses 7 through 13. There will be an ecological crisis everywhere once that tribulation hits and once the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. Friend, there's going to be so many ecological problems during that great tribulation. It's going to be literally terror and shocking and people are going to be going crazy during that tribulation period. Now, our next distinction between the rapture And the literal, visible advent of Jesus Christ is, during the rapture, Christ does not judge Jews or nations. None of his enemies are killed at the rapture. But in contrast to that, during the second advent, he judges the whole world. And you can read about that in Matthew 25, 31-32. And not only that, during the Great Tribulation, there are over 200 million that are killed that come from the east at that advent. You can read about that in Revelation 9.16, which reads, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, and I heard the number of them. And it says a little bit further, in verse 18, By these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And we'll take one more contrast. During the rapture of the body of Christ, The position of Satan does not change. He is not thrown into any bottomless pit as it happens during the second advent. During the second advent, Jesus will return to defeat the Antichrist 
destroy evil, and establish his millennial kingdom. The second coming is described in Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now that's the literal second advent, and by the way, we come back with him, we are his army, and we're going to be fighting, and we're going to be in perfect bodies. That has nothing to do with the rapture of the body of Christ. Now folks, we could go on and on, and we've got 30 listed in our outline here, so if you open up that outline, you will notice all 30 contrasts, and that's barely touching the tip of the iceberg. Folks, there's so much, there's so much contrast between the rapture of the body of Christ and the great tribulation. It's just pitiful that there are a great many of folk in the body of Christ that cannot see the difference. They are dull of hearing. God has shut their eyes because number one, a lot of them have put aside the King James Bible. So in concluding, you and I can be confident of this very thing that he which hath, hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Biblical Christianity is the only faith that gives true comfort at the gravesite. Any preacher or teacher that has done a funeral, uh, you've had to do a funeral, you know that if that person was saved, you know exactly where, you should know exactly where they're at. They're up there with the Lord Jesus Christ in God's glory in the third heaven. And for the believer in Christ today, The rapture is a very great comfort. The Lord Jesus Christ said, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. And then the Bible talks about the scriptures being a comfort. For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And if you've got the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you've got that blessed hope and the great comfort knowing that Jesus Christ is coming back. He's going to catch you up out of here. Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 13, we read, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And friend, if you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have no hope. You are without God, without Christ, and without hope. But you can have hope. You can have the blessed hope. All you've got to do by faith is simply trust in the one who paid the price of your sin debt. Right now, you're in debt. It says if you're behind bars and you're doing life and then you've got to sit on the hot seat and you're just waiting to burn. Well, Jesus Christ already took that burning for you on Calvary's cross and drank the cup of the wrath of God. The Bible says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you want to get out from under that wrath and under the curse of God, come to Jesus Christ. He's the only one that could pay for the sin debt of man. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Come to Jesus Christ today. He receiveth sinners. Just look to him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't want to go to hell. I want to be saved and go to heaven when I die. I want to trust Jesus Christ as my personal Savior right now. Do that and be saved. Amen. Lift it.
You've been listening to the Bible broadcast with Perry Demopoulos. We're glad that you joined with us for today's broadcast and hope the Lord has spoken to your heart. If you'd like to know more about the Christian walk, please let us know. If you've made the decision to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you may write to us at the following email address, pdkjv1611 at gmail.com. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you in His will. Oh